This is going to be verse by verse of Psalms 15. And we're going to look, once again, look at this psalm in a way that you've probably never looked at it before. Because most people just look at the psalms in a devotional way only. But in Psalms 15, 1, it says, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Now, doctrinally and prophetically, is what we're going to mainly focus on. This is referring to the millennium. Who is going to dwell in his holy hill? Verse 2. He that walketh uprightly, and worketh righteousness, and speaketh the truth in his heart. So if you look at these in the prophetic sense, then imagine a believer in the tribulation time period. Is he going to abide in the doctrine of Christ? Is he going to... Keep the commandments and the faith of Jesus Christ so that he can, so that he'll be walking uprightly, working righteousness, and speaking the truth in his heart. As it says in Revelation 14 12, referring to the people, the saints who are in the tribulation, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So in the tribulation, if you are going to go into the millennium, to abide in the tabernacle and dwell in his holy hill, then you have to endure unto the end without giving into the Antichrist system. Now, this isn't talking about us. We're born-again believers in the church age. We're not going through the tribulation. When the tribulation is going on, we're going to be with the Lord because we've done been raptured out. But these saints in the tribulation, if they're going to go into the millennium, is what we're referring to. So why do they have to keep the commandments? As Revelation 14 says. Think about the commandments for a minute. If you think that sounds far-fetched. Exodus 20, 3 through 4 says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. So if you go after the Antichrist then you are having a God before Jesus Christ. If you worship the beast in his image, then you are setting up a graven image. And that's what many people are going to do in the tribulation. They're going to go after the Antichrist, and then they're putting a God before Jesus Christ. If you worship the beast in his image, then you're setting up a graven image. Already going against two commandments there. Then Exodus 20 and verse 7, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Do you know what the Antichrist will do when he sits in the temple? He's going to blaspheme God and take his name in vain. In Revelation 13, 5 and 6, it says, There was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. So, if the people in the tribulation, if they worship this man of sin, they do the same thing. They're partaker of his evil deeds. Uh, Exodus 20 and verse 8, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You say, well, what about that commandment there? You can't tell me that this one matters in the tribulation. I admit that we're not under the Sabbath today. Paul plainly tells us in Colossians that let no man judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moons or of the Sabbath days. We don't have to keep the Sabbath. Jesus Christ is our Sabbath and he keeps us. We don't keep the Sabbath. Our Sabbath keeps us. So we're not under the Sabbath, but... You've you got to remember that when the church leaves in the rapture, it goes back to God dealing with Israel. Things are going to go back to like they were before the church. There's going to be Sabbath keeping in the tribulation. Look at Matthew 24. If you don't believe me, look at Matthew 24. And you know the context of Matthew 24. It's God talking to the, the disciples after they ask him the question, what shall be thy sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? That's the context. The end of the world, the tribulation. Matthew 24, 20 through 21. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. So the Sabbath 
comes back, if you believe the Bible. Exodus 20, 12. Let's look at another one. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So did you know that the Antichrist system, you're going to have to sell out your own family, your own parents and siblings in the trib. You're going to need to be like Rahab who hides the spies, pretty much. A saint in the tribulation should give his own life before he sells out his parents or even some random Jew to the Antichrist henchmen. Honor thy father and thy mother. That's going to apply in the tribulation. It applies today. I mean, and even all these commandments apply today. Uh, they have nothing to do with whether or not we're going to heaven. We're not saved by works. But a lot of people think, well, the Ten Commandments, that's just Old Testament. No, the Ten Commandments, other than the Sabbath day, they're all for today. And you should abide by those Ten Commandments. And then in the tribulation, it, it, it goes even a step further. Because as you've already seen in Revelation chapter 14, that verse I showed you, and you clearly see in Psalms 15 that to get into the millennium, these people are going to have to keep the commandments. And I'm showing you why right now. But Exodus 20 and verse 13, it says, Thou shalt not kill. Jesus said in Matthew 24, and referring to the end of the world, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. People in the tribulation are going to be able to kill you for no reason in the tribulation. I mean, they're already, it's already starting to go that way, even in America here. You see, these people are just doing what they want to do. In the tribulation, it's going to be like the Purge movie. Is what it's going to be like. Uh, Exodus twenty fourteen. it says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. In the tribulation, there will be Jezebel seducing men to commit adultery. Revelation 2, 22, it says, Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and then that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. So those saints will have to turn from that temptation. This isn't just physical adultery. It's spiritual. If they fall away from the truth and turn to the Antichrist system, then they commit spiritual adultery. Revelation 2, 20, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to do my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Exodus twenty fifteen. Thou shalt not steal. A saint in the tribulation can't buy or sell without the mark. So can he steal? Not if he keeps the commandments of God. And you can't take the mark and go to and go to, into the millennium. If you take the mark, it's, it says you're going, you're guaranteed hell if you take the mark of the beast. That's the big thing here, is that mark of the beast. You see, there's nothing in this age that we're living in right now that can, that I can do that can make me lose my salvation. Nothing. I'm eternally secure. Uh, there's nothing that the government can say that I must do or force me to do that if I do it, I will lose my salvation. Uh, people talk about they are the mark of the beast is already here, and if I got a chip in, then that's the mark of the beast. Look, I don't want to have a chip in, but if they made it mandatory today to put a chip in, I wouldn't go to hell for if if they made me do it because. That's not the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast doesn't show up until the church leaves. And I'm part of the church, and if you're saved, you're part of the church. So really, you shouldn't be worried about taking the mark because it's not going to come while you're here. But it's these saints in the tribulation. They can't buy or sell without the mark. So the only way they're going to get food is if God gives it to them in some form or fashion, or if they steal it. They're going to have to wait on God if they want to go into the millennium. Uh, Exodus twenty sixteen through 17. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. So why will a man take the mark? Because he's covetous. This just said, thou shalt not covet. He will want something that he shouldn't have, and he'll do whatever it takes to get it, even 
if it's taking the mark of the beast and worshiping, worshiping him. And if he does that, he's not walking uprightly, as it says to do in Psalms 15, 2, and he's not going to dwell in his holy hill. A born-again Christian today, if that's what you are, if you believe the gospel, you are going into the kingdom no matter what. No matter what you say or do. Now, you should live right. I'm not telling you you have a free pass to do whatever you want to. You ought to live right. But a Christian today, you're going into the kingdom no matter what. You're part of the body of Christ. If you were to lose your salvation, you would have to be amputated from the Lord's body. And that's not going to happen. Now, if you're a born-again Christian who doesn't go by the commandments of God, then you won't inherit anything in the kingdom. When it comes to things like the Sabbath, that's for Israel. It's not for you. You don't have to worry about keeping the Sabbath. You don't have to do that. However, all these commandments that we've mentioned in the Old Testament against things like adultery, stealing, lying, worshiping something other than God, and so forth and so on, all of these things are something that are still applied to you. You aren't saved by works. You're not saved by keeping the law, but you still need to live right if you want to set up treasures in eternity. So Psalms 15.1, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? If you are a born-again Christian, then nothing can separate you from being a part of the body of Christ. But are you constantly living right and having your mind on Jesus Christ? Are you... Are you uh, acknowledging that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Psalm 15, 3. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. So that's who's going to dwell in his holy hill. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. This is a big one. Do you... Referring back to you here in a practical sense, do you find yourself constantly backbiting someone? Galatians 5.15 says, But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. Backbiters is listed in that long list of sins in Romans 1. The best thing to do is not talk bad about anyone, period. What good does it do anyway? It just it goes back around to the person eventually. It can hurt the person. It also most likely won't fix the problem you have with the person by talking bad about him. So he that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. Imagine a world where men treated men like they want to be treated themselves. Aren't you glad that your parents didn't get an abortion? Would you like it if someone stole from you? lied to you, cheated with your wife, vandalized your property, talked bad behind your back, if you wouldn't like these things done to you, then why do you continue to do these things to other people? Why can't you get your own job, your own car, your own clothes, your own house, and your own wife? Go to work and leave people alone. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Why do you do evil to your neighbor? Everyone is on level ground. Nobody is better than anyone else. Every person has a right to live unless they take someone else's life. So why can't you mind your own business and quit hurting other people around you? If people would just have that mindset, uh, you wouldn't have to lock your door at night. But people don't have that mindset. They backbite with their tongue. They do evil to their neighbor. They take up reproach against their neighbor. The saint in the tribulation, if the saint in the tribulation does these things, he's not walking uprightly. It plainly says it. You think I'm just, I'm just speaking uh, uh, up my own ideas here, but it's what it plainly says. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? And then it tells you who's going to. I mean, this isn't doctrinally to us. That's why it doesn't say he that believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, that's it's not to us doctrinal in the doctrinal sense here. We're gonna get we're getting some little bit of practical application out of it. But it says, "Who shall abide in that tabernacle? Who shall dwell in the holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart." 
I mean, I'm going, I'm going to be with the Lord Jesus Christ no matter what. Even if I didn't do these things, I'm going to be with Jesus Christ. But the saint in the tribulation, if he doesn't do these things, he's not going into the millennium. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned. But he honoreth them that fear the Lord, he that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. So it says, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned, extremely wicked men should not be looked at in a positive light by a saint. Titus 1.8 shows that we should be a lover of good men. Proverbs 2 talks about how we should walk in the way of good men. However, who are the men who are sought out the most today? The vile men. Today, being vile is glorified. I recently heard a song where some female rapper is bragging about being savage and how much of a whore she is. Uh, that is who is honored today. That's who's getting the glory today. That vile person is not being contemned in people's eyes. But if you're a Christian, you ought to see that stuff as wicked, filthy garbage. Because you know who's a vile person? The Antichrist is a vile person. And the people in the tribulation who are going to see this Antichrist on TV or maybe even in person, they're going to have to see him as the vile person that he is and not as some savior bringing in peace. Daniel eleven twenty one it says, And his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Psalms 15, 5, He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. So usury is interest. And the phrase, not taketh reward against the innocent, what would that mean to take reward against the innocent? That reminds me of the wicked sex traffickers who steal the innocent kids in exchange for money. Uh, not long ago at a Walmart in a very small town close to me, very small. There were three vans outside of this Walmart with three men next to the vans with cell phones just out in the open in the broad daylight. And, the, and they then they had men inside following a young couple that had their kid with them. And this small, not even a super Walmart, not even that many people there. And they were trying to take a child from their parents. That's disturbing that people are so twisted that they would do something so demonic. But when we get to the millennium, when we get into his holy hill, you, a, a couple could let their child walk around by himself. And this, these type of things not going to happen no more. God is going to get rid of all these people. He's going to drive these people out of the land. They're not going to be there. The unclean spirit will pass from the land. The devil is going to be chained up in the bottomless pit. It's going to be the greatest time the world's ever seen. So you need to get saved today. That way you can be you can be in that time. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's the only thing that's going to get you to heaven. You're not saved by... I, I believe salvation is so free. You're not saved by living right before you believe on Jesus Christ. You're not saved by living right after you believe on Jesus Christ. The life that you live is a completely separate issue from your salvation itself. You're saved because of the life of Jesus Christ, because of his death. Jesus Christ died, was buried, and resurrected. He shed his blood. You believe that, you're going to heaven. And his life, his righteous life, is imputed to you, and that's what saves you. It's not your righteous life. I mean, whose record is on your permanent record? Do you think your righteousness is on your permanent record or something? I give the comparison all the time. Imagine there's a file cabinet in heaven. You got a folder with your name on it. And before you got saved, it's got all the bad things wrote down that you've ever done and ever will do. But then when you get saved, God takes those files out of your file, uh, folder and puts in the Lord Jesus Christ's files, which has no sin on it. 
You got his righteousness, and that's why you get to go to heaven. You're not going to heaven because you deserve it. If you didn't deserve it before you were saved, how do you think you're going to deserve it after you're saved? You didn't deserve it to begin with, and you don't deserve it now. It's completely free. The only way you're getting to heaven is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way that you're going to go into the millennium and dwell in his holy hill is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, for the saint in the tribulation, by these clear verses, it's a little bit of a different story. As you plain, you can either, you can either say, well, I've never heard what you're saying, so I don't believe it, or you can go by what these verses said here in Psalms and in Revelation, that to dwell in his holy hill, those saints in the tribulation are going to have to walk uprightly. They're going to have to do all these things. You see us, we, we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. When God sees me, he sees the blood. He sees, he sees me walking uprightly because he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ on my record. He doesn't see my righteousness. But that last verse said, He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent, he that doeth these things shall never be moved. So if you abstain from doing the bad things mentioned in this psalm, then you're not going to be moved. This is because you'll have a big rock behind you, which is Jesus Christ backing up everything you do and say. But like I said, we looked at this psalm in a different light than most people look at it. We looked at it in a doctrinal, prophetical sense. And we got a little bit of practical application for us. But remember, you have to rightly divide the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There, Everything in the Bible I can look at and get practical application for me, no matter where it is. But not all of it applies to me in the doctrinal sense. Some of it is for me in the doctrinal sense. Some of it's for people in tribulation in the doctrinal sense. You've got to rightly divide. You've got to figure out who is this talking to. But this has been Psalms chapter 15.